All right, hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Geist Christian Church at our Promise Road campus. It is great to see you all here today, those who are gathered in person with us, those who are worshiping online. We're glad you're here. I'm Danny Goulden. I serve as the lead pastor here at Geist. Samantha Copeland, our minister for youth and young adults, is leading worship with me this morning along with our wonderful praise team. As we uh, settle in, get started this morning, just a couple of things that we want to uh, make you aware of going on in the life of the church. We are continuing our Fueled for School, our summer uh, meals program for those who otherwise might not have a meal. We had peanut butter this week. Um, I think we have oatmeal packets coming up next week for next Sunday, so make sure you bring your oatmeal packets, but know that those gifts are appreciated and they are feeding a lot of people. And so thank you for that. Thank you for your generosity uh, for that. This upcoming Wednesday, um, our youth, uh, our 7th through 12th graders, the whole youth ministry is headed to Kings Island um, over near uh, Cincinnati, Dayton, Ohio. We're going to meet here at the Promise Road campus at 8 p.m. or 8 a.m. We should be back. Uh, they should be back hopefully by 8 p.m. that day. Um, it's a wonderful day at Kings Island. The cost to do this is $40. And so um, we look forward to seeing all our grade 7 through 12 students here at Promise Road. They'll take the buses over um, and have a wonderful day at Kings Island. And they are welcome to invite someone and to uh, bring friends for that as well. Um, we want to uh, give you the opportunity, if you feel so called, to give to the mission and ministry of Geist Christian Church. There are several ways that um, you can do that. Uh, we've got some in-person offering baskets here um, if you're worshiping in person. We also have uh, uh, online giving. You can go to geistchristian.org slash give and give there. Um, a lot of folks set up reoccurring giving, but just know that your gifts do make a difference. Uh, they help us do mission and ministry in this community, and so um, we appreciate that. And even here in the summer months where life slows down a little bit, that mission and ministry certainly uh, continues on. Uh, we'd love to know who's worshiping with us. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, we have a heart for God, a heart for people. Um, we'd love to welcome you in uh, to worship, welcome you into the Geist family. If you um, uh, can go to the sign-in sheet, you can do the QR code. You see those on the screen. We have those around the building as well. If you're worshiping at home, that should be on your screen as well. Um, you can also go to geistchristian.org slash here. You can find that there as well. We've got some physical sign-in cards in the back. Um, we'd love to, like I said, love to connect with you. We'd love to pray for you. We're a praying community. So if you have a prayer concern, a prayer need, we would love to be able to lift that up this week and be in prayer for you. You can put that there as well. Um, if this is your very first time worshiping with us, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. We've got a very special gift for you. We'd love to meet you. Uh, we'll be out at the circle desk in the lobby on your way out. So later on today, as you go out to get coffee and donuts and all that good stuff, stop by. Um, and like I said, we'd love to say hello. We'd love to uh, greet you. Um, if you're a social media user, we'd love for you to check in on whatever social media um, site you use. Just let people know where you are spending your Sunday morning. That certainly helps us get the word out about Geist as well. Uh, once again, welcome to worship. We're glad that you're here today, glad that we can gather and worship together. Uh, whether we rise in body or in spirit, let us stand together as we begin worship. Well, good morning again. So great to see all of you here this morning. Welcome again to Geist Christian Church. I'm Julianne. This is Julie. We're going to lead you in some songs this morning, and you're going to hear a theme about a victory, about believing in the goodness of God. So sing along with us this morning with that prayer and power in our hearts. We give Him glory. Here we go. I give you glory for all you brought me.
That's something that you do each and every morning, turn it over to God. But I'm guilty of getting going in my day and trying and trying to do it all myself and then remembering, oh yeah, this isn't my battle to fight. I need to surrender it to God. Palms up, take it from me and he will. I love that song because there is such power in positive thinking. You've maybe heard motivational speakers say that. Maybe our own CJ has talked about the power of positivity. But to declare something as truth, you begin to own it and understand it and accept it and to say, I'm going to see a victory. 
So this morning, I'm going to challenge us, myself included, that whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever, whatever um, burden, whatever struggle, whatever battle you're hanging on to this morning, at least for the next 50 minutes, let's just hold in our hearts that we will see a victory. And I'm just going to challenge you to hold on to that belief this morning. And at least in this morning, as we hear the message from Pastor Danny, and as we hear these songs, and as we partake in communion, that we just have that as a constant presence in our mind, that we know God said it's possible. So therefore, I'm going to see a victory. The battle belongs to him and not me. We're going to sing another song together, King of Kings. And the words in this are so beautiful because it's really about that mountain we climb each and every time. And at the top, at the very, very top is God, Christ, our Savior. Sing this one along with us. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To to a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
Let us pray. Holy God, as the world spins around us and the summer seems to fly by before our eyes, we stop for a moment this morning to take a breath, to center ourselves in your great presence. May we take a moment to rest here, praising you, lifting up our joys and all of those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. This morning, as a community, we lift these prayers to you. We pray for Jennifer and Sandy for their healing. Lord, walk alongside them in their journey. May they see your face and know your love at every turn. We say prayers for Bill and Gail as they prepare for surgery this coming week. May they see your face in those faces of their doctors and nurses and care team that surround them. As we worship here this day, Lord, transform us. Make us instruments of your peace, vessels of your love, and make us into your hands and feet in this world to go out and share your grace to everyone that we meet. We pray this together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sam, your sermon notes are still up here from last week, and your sermon's probably better than mine, so I'm just going to preach it. Is that okay? So if I get confused, and in one moment I'm talking about David and Goliath, and the next Jonah, it's not a mashup. It's just uh, we, got, we got messed up up here. So we're in the series called Epic Tales, and we've been looking at some of the stories from the Old Testament that some of which we have known since childhood. You don't have to have been or be a religious person to know these stories, and other of these stories you may not be as familiar with. Today's story, the story of David and Goliath, you are probably familiar with religious, non-religious. It is one of the most commonly used stories in our modern culture. So any situation, of course, involving someone overcoming a great obstacle is what we would refer to as a D David versus Goliath moment. If you are a sports fan, right, the big underdog is always known as David and the, the champion that, that cannot be overcome except by some miracle is always known as Goliath. Goliath is always expected to win and David is the underdog working to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. And in those instances, right, those rare instances, it feels like, where David defeats Goliath, it is a big deal. Collectively, we are surprised because no one, no one expects David to win. And so we owe this modern analogy, we owe this to an event that happened many years ago in the Middle Eastern Valley of Allah where the kingdom of Israel was in conflict with the Philistine army. And they're going to have a battle. They're going to have an epic battle. And so someone who is six foot nine, wearing a helmet and full body armor, one known as a fierce warrior who could not be defeated, faced a small shepherd boy from Bethlehem who was basically there by accident. 
David got elected because he, he happened to basically be standing in a line of people and when they said, who wants to take on Goliath, step forward, everyone else stepped back. And so it looked like David had stepped forward. And so for David and for Israel, Goliath was the obstacle of all obstacles. And so when we hear the descriptions of Goliath and David at first glance, we're not surprised that this is a big obstacle, right? You have this mighty, fierce warrior, and you have this very ordinary boy. Listen to this description, how the, the book of 1 Samuel describes Goliath. A champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was more than nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore bronze scale armor weighing 125 pounds. He had bronze plates on his shins. He had a bronze shimeter hung on his back. His spear shaft was as strong as the bar on a weaver's loom, and its iron head weighed 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked in front of him. And so now that we hold that image, we also hold this image of David. Then Saul dressed David in his own gear, putting a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David strapped his sword on over the armor, but he couldn't walk around well because he'd never tried it before. I can't walk in this, David told Saul, because I've never tried it before. So he took them off. He then grabbed his staff and he chose five smooth stones from the stream bed. He put them in the pocket of his shepherd's bag with a sling in his hand, and he went out to the Philistine. So here we have two very different images. One image of Goliath, one image of David. And so today we are always surprised, right, when David, the David in any scenario, somehow overcomes the immovable force that is Goliath. But what if in that day, in the Allah Valley, for those gathered there, what if their perspective was a little bit different? And what if we have missed that perspective and we sort of get wrong what happens when David meets Goliath? Uh, why does David run towards the challenge? That's a piece of the scripture, the very last line where he went out to the Philistine. And so not only does David not sly away, uh, sly away from this challenge, but he runs toward it. What if we shouldn't be surprised at all when David defeats Goliath? And what if those people who saw that firsthand, who saw David and Goliath getting ready to do battle, what if all of them would have believed, for the most part, that David was going to win? That David was going to overcome the seemingly great challenge? For one thing, in fact, in God's economy, it's what happened. In God's realm, and God's world, it's what happens by the power and the presence of God and our faith in that power and presence. We can overcome any obstacle. We can go uh, overcome anything that is placed in our way. I mean, David goes running toward Goliath. And so I love the question that the author Malcolm Gladwell asks about this epic tale. He says, when we see the giant, why do we automatically assume the battle is theirs for the winning? When we see the giant, why do we automatically assume theirs is the battle for winning? There was a gentleman named Vivit Randadive, and he coached a girls' 7th and 8th grade basketball team in the National Junior Basketball League. And he had never coached basketball. He didn't know much about basketball. He didn't know much about this team. And, and let's just say when they got off the bus, they certainly did not intimidate anyone. 
They weren't very tall. They weren't great shooters. They couldn't overpower people. Very few of them were good at dribbling. Even fewer of them were good at passing. They were inexperienced. In short, against any decent basketball team, they really had no chance. I mean, when you have inexperienced coaching, a a lack of physical talent, and a skills gap, that usually doesn't lead to you winning games 95% of the time. But that's exactly what this girls' basketball team did. You see, Ranadive knew that he knew nothing about basketball. And so he started closely studying the rules of the game, and he picked up on a way in which his team could be better than the other teams. He picked up on a way within the rules that his team could overcome any obstacle. And so the first rule he picked up on was that five seconds after you score, uh, the other team has five seconds to inbound the ball. And the second rule was the 10-second rule, the the 10 seconds that a team has to pass half court when they bring the ball up. Now, if you know anything about basketball, and since we're in Indiana, you better know something about basketball, right? I think you have to. Uh, You know that these are pretty mundane rules, right? Occasionally, you'll see a five-second violation. Occasionally, you'll see a 10-second violation. But it's not something that happens all the time. It's, It's pretty boring. But with the Redwood City girls, they saw an opportunity. And so what they did was they pressed after every single made basket. They would play a high-risk strategy of denying the ball, denying the inbounds pass after every single made basket. They guarded after every single made basket like their life depended on it. They didn't even want the other team to inbound the ball. And so Randadive knew that maybe he couldn't make these girls better shooters. He definitely knew he couldn't make them any taller, but he knew that they could outrun and outlast and outwork pretty much anyone on a basketball court, and so they spent all of their practices running. And if you didn't buy into this, and this wasn't the team for you, but they spent all practice time running. And so their approach was so shocking to other teams, right? Because usually teams don't press that intensely unless it's the end of the game or maybe the end of a half. And so especially for teams who hadn't seen them play before, it was shocking. And so the Redwood City girls, they would start games with leads of 6-0, 8-0, 12-0. One time they went up 25-0 on the uh, before the other team even knew what had happened to them. And so their gift was this, their competitive advantage, the way they overcame the obstacles they faced is they were willing to play and try harder than anyone else. They would not be outworked, they would not be outtried, and they committed to it. And so if you just looked at them versus the teams they were playing, you would say that David in that instance always defeated Goliath. David always defeated Goliath. Now, you've probably heard this phrase that was coined by Theodore Roosevelt long ago, that comparison is the thief of joy. And often when we compare ourselves to others, right, it's a natural human tendency. We do it. We can't help ourselves, right? But it also is something that is not healthy for us because whenever we compare ourselves to other people, we feel inadequate. We focus on what we don't have rather than what we do have. We lament the gifts that we don't have and we ignore the ones we do, right? We tend to focus on, I'm not 6'4". Comparison, of course, leads to dissatisfaction. It leads to disappointment. It's no way to live and we know all of this. We know that when we focus on others, when we compare ourselves to others, we focus on what we don't have and we focus on the gifts we don't have, but it's like we can't help ourselves. This is the way that we tend to live, if only, if only. And so comparison is the thief of joy. It's no way to live. And I say this because we tend to make Goliath into the giant that Goliath is not. 
We make Goliath into the giant that Goliath is not. We start diminishing ourselves. We start diminishing who God has made us and created us to be. We discount the gifts and the spirit that God has given to each of us. We lose faith in ourselves. We lose faith in God because we tend to focus on how we aren't rather than focusing on what God has made us to be. Focusing on what God has called us to do. We, we ignore the gifts that God has given each and every one of us because we're so worried about that gift or two that we maybe don't have. You see, in that valley that day, almost every single person understood God's economy, we can guess. They understood how God worked. They understood the gifts that David had in that moment that God had given David, right? If you read the description of Goliath again, as you, as you kind of pay attention to it, you realize that Goliath is pretty slow. He's nine feet tall. He's bulky. He's wearing heavy armor that weighs him down, causing him limited mobility. He can't move. And he's led into the valley by an attendant because he couldn't see very well. Many believe that Goliath was nearly blind. And so he needed to be led around so, so someone could tell him where to go. He needed someone to lead him in that way. And then we look again at David, right? David lets go of the heavy armor because he wasn't quick in it. He took five smooth stones because he knew, and most everyone else in that valley knew, that David was one of the best slingshot artists around. They knew that David was quick, and they knew that it would not be hard for him to hit Goliath. And maybe most importantly, David is described like this in 1 Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, Have no regard for his appearance or statue because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what is visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees what is in the heart. The Lord sees what is in the heart. The good news in this is your best gift is you. Your best gift is that God knows you. Now, that can be intimidating, this idea that the Lord sees in the heart, that the Lord might know us that intimately, that God knows us so well and has given us gifts that are unique to each of us. But we can guess that David knew that. And so, in many ways, in many ways, if Goliath had somehow prevailed that day, it would have shocked those who were sitting there. It would have surprised those who were watching firsthand. You see, the upset is not when David wins. The upset is when Goliath wins. But in God's economy, we are created. We are created to be able to do things that we can't even imagine, that we can't see. In fact, so we sometimes have such a hard time seeing it that we flip it around. But there are things we can do that God has uniquely created us to do. That leads to what I believe is the biggest gift that we as people of faith can offer, what we have been created to do. That leads to the biggest gift the church has to offer, uh, yet living out this gift, it's so simple, but it's actually turned into Christianity's biggest Goliath. It's the thing that we, like David, should run toward with all that we can muster. It is the thing that we should have the faith to do, that we have been made to do. It was Jesus' greatest commandment, and that is to love one another to love one another. So clear. We as the church, we as people of faith are uniquely gifted to do just that, but we've made this simple idea into a Goliath. 
We've made it so hard to do. We've made it act like it's something we can't overcome when in fact it is exactly what we are made to do. We've made it into an obstacle rather than a pathway to faith. But this idea to love one another, this idea to share God's love, it should be natural to us. It should be a key part of our faith in God through Jesus Christ. Of all the obstacles we might face, of all the challenges we might face, of all the perceived Goliaths that we might face, it's the one that when we look around, we should say we should be able to do this, overcome anything so that we might do this each and every time to love one another, to love everybody because it's what we are made to do. It's what we are made to do. To do. It's what Christian community can and should do better than any other community. So church, we need to change our perspective. When it comes to David and Goliath, when it comes to this epic tale, we need to change our perspective. Because you are uniquely gifted. We are uniquely gifted to do the things that God calls us to do and to overcome anything that might prevent us from doing just that. Let us pray together. Gracious to God, help us, help us to open our eyes. Help us to open our hearts. Help us to see that we do not need to compare ourselves to others because we know that that comparison is the thief of joy. Help us, each and every one of us, to see that we are uniquely gifted. We are uniquely called. That you see into our heart, that you know that. And so help us to know that. Help us know that we can run toward any obstacle with confidence. Because we don't run alone, because you run with us. And help us, O oh God, each to do the thing we need to do to run toward with all the faith and courage we can muster that which is Jesus' greatest commandment to love one another. Help us, O oh God, to remove that as a, a Goliath, an obstacle. And help us to see that it is the way that you call us to be. That it is the way you call us to live. For it's in Christ's name we offer this prayer. Amen. to lose I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to do Lord with your strength I've got no excuse this broken people are exactly who you use so keep me faith like Daniel in the lion's den give me hope like Moses in the wilderness give me a
face my giants with confidence. In a world so concerned with who are the winners and who are the losers, we come and find ourselves at the foot of this table. Here, there is no winners or losers column. It doesn't matter if you yourself are a fan of the national champions, the Georgia Bulldogs, or a fan of the fierce TCU Frogs who somehow did not hold on to the title. Score is not kept here. Everyone is welcome. It is a piece of what the kingdom of God looks like. And so we come here each week to be reminded of the world we are working for and praying for. One full of God's love and grace with no exceptions or limitations. And so now we remember together that night when Jesus gathered with his disciples, his closest friends, and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is given for each of you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, pouring it out and blessing it, saying, this is the cup of my abundant grace, which is given for each and every one of you. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, creator of all things, we thank you for inviting us to this table today where we might gain the sustenance we need to perform the task you have given us in this world, whether they seem great or small, knowing you will be standing with us. We thank you also for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, as he died for the forgiveness of our sins, and ask you to bless this bread and this cup as symbols of his sacrifice. We ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can reflect your presence to all whom we meet and in all that we do in the week ahead. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You are invited to come forward to take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup or to come up and grab a prepackaged communion or one of our gluten-free communions. We ask that everyone come down the center aisle and come to one of the stations or up to the table to grab one of the prepackaged communions and then go back to your seats through the side aisles. The table is set and all are welcome. Let us come and eat together. No. 
Thank you, Julianne. Thank you, Greg. Uh, one of the ways in which we respond to God's grace that we receive at this table is um, just a, an invitation. Uh, if you have not yet made a profession of faith um, in Jesus Christ, and that's something that you have been thinking about and uh, would like to talk more about, um, both myself, uh, Pastor Sam, Pastor Katie, we are here to talk with you about that. We'd love to talk with you further. Uh, maybe you've already made that profession. You're looking for a church home, a church community, um, and you want to say yes to Guys Christian Church. We'd love to help you with that and talk uh, a little bit more about you with that. We'll be around after worship, so feel free to, to talk to us. We'd love to um, talk with you further about that um, or, or any time. We can uh, grab coffee, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, but we just want to make sure that you know that invitation is there. Uh, we certainly want to invite you out for uh, some coffee, some donuts, some treats, all of that in the lobby following worship. If it is your first time, welcome. We hope that you have felt the Spirit of God um, in your life and in this place. We'd love to meet you, get to know you a little bit better, um, and we have a gift for you out at the welcome desk in the lobby, and we certainly hope to see you all uh, next week once again at 10 a.m. Uh, let us rise, whether in body or spirit. I'm going to offer a prayer for us for the week, and then we have uh, one more song of worship together. Uh, let us pray together. O oh, gracious and loving God, indeed, help us go with confidence. Help us to go toward our giants in confidence. Help us to see these differently, not as obstacles, but as pathways to faith. Help us each to know the unique gifts that you have given us. Help us to know that you see each and every one of us and you know each and every one of us intimately. And this is the greatest gift that we could ever receive. May we go in your grace and in your peace and in your courage. Amen. All right, let's sing together one more time before we head out today. go. I raise the hallelujah in the presence of my 